Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ms. Jennifer Bricker. Thank you. It's so good to be here. I'm so excited. This is my first time in Malaysia, first time in Southeast Asia, and I am loving the weather, loving all the different foods, and absolutely loving all the hospitality, especially here at Lisa. I just want to thank you all for, for bringing me over here. So far, it's been such an amazing and incredible experience. So I just want to say thank you so much. Are you guys having fun? How was your tea? Was it good? Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, I got a little, little more enthusiasm, a little more energy, so was it good? Yes. All right, that's awesome. Well, you know, I get, to, I get to, it is an honor and a privilege for me to travel the world performing as an aerialist and an acrobat and a speaker. It's, it's actually quite funny now that I think about being a speaker because when people first told me, you need to be a speaker, you need to write a book, from when I was really young, I was almost like, oh, me, a speaker? Like, I was so offended. Like, what? Aren't I supposed to have gray hair and be a speaker? <laughs> For some reason, I just, I thought of being a speaker as I had to be old. I had to be distinguished. I had to, you know, be completely different. And I was like, I'm an acrobat. I'm an aerialist. I'm young. Me, a speaker? I was almost offended by the idea. And so now, the joy that it brings me, I mean, people say, well, Jen, you're the inspiration and you motivate me. But I got to tell you, all of you, the audiences that I speak to, inspire me and feed me and give to me. And it is such an honor and a blessing. I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart when I say it is a privilege for me to be able to just share my life story. I think, wow, they really want to listen to me talk about my life? That's so cool. It's so flattering and, and, and so much fun for me. It's hard to believe when I, because I do talk about my life so much, you have a lot of time to reflect about your life. You're kind of nitpicking it and, and talking at different parts. And it's really unbelievable for me to realize that the first set of doctors that my parents took me to after I was adopted told them I would never, ever sit up on my own. This was an established hospital and a team of doctors that with confidence, 100%, your daughter will never sit up on her own. She's going to be confined to this, they called it a bucket, okay? And it was going to hold me upright and in my back. And that was my future. Can you imagine me as bucket girl? I don't think that's really cute on anyone. I definitely doesn't fit for me. And my parents didn't think so either. They just said, you know what? There's got to be more for her. They, they fought for me. I was their miracle. I was their blessing. They technically should never have been able to have been allowed to adopt me. My mom was 40, my dad was 42. They had three boys, 10, 12, and 14 years old. After the third boy, my mom couldn't have kids anymore. And she always wanted a baby girl. And she prayed and prayed and prayed for 10 years. She wanted a baby girl so badly, she never gave up her faith and her hope and her desire for that baby girl. And one day, she hears her, her best friend at the time was looking to adopt. And she had heard about me, but she ran a daycare, so she wasn't sure if she could handle a kid with disabilities, so she told my mom about me. And I think my mom just heard, baby girl, needs a home. Yeah, I think I'll take her. <laughs> Doesn't matter if she doesn't have legs. <laughs> it really, you know, the, the amazing thing about my parents is they don't even realize how awesome they are. They're just like, well, you know, we kind of stumbled through it, and she kind of somehow turned out awesome. I don't know. And they just, they're so humble. And, and uh, that's one of many lessons I've learned from them is humbleness. To, you know, my entire speech, pretty much, you're going to hear me talking about them. Because they're the ones that gave me the mindset. They provided the environment for me to thrive. They allowed me to be who I was, who I am. And so they're back to square one. My mom hears about me. Okay, I've got to convince my husband now. All right. I want this baby girl. All right, I'm going to tell her, tell my husband about it. So she goes and tells my dad. He was on board. He didn't even get three words out. Well, if I thought, okay, yep, that's all I need to know. Okay, good. I'm glad you agree. And then she went and talked to my brothers who, again, they were 10, 12, and 14 years old, all boys. And she talked to them. She sat them down. They sat them down individually and asked them, you know, what would it mean for you to have 
a sister without legs. How would you feel? The oldest one was going to be dating in a couple of years, so they said, okay, here's the scenario. If, if you're on a date and you bring them home to meet all of us and you have a sister without legs, you know, what if they think it's weird? What if they're bothered by that? How would you feel about that? And the beautiful response from all three of them individually was, if they have a problem with it, then I don't want them in my life anyway. And I just thought, to, the, to this day, you know, I don't remember this, of course, I was an infant, but to this day, that story just touches my heart. How amazing that they were so young and they just had that in them to say, you know what? I don't want to be around people who are going to discriminate because my sister's different. I thought that, was, that touches my heart. It will, it will forever touch my heart. I will forever speak about that story. And so they adopted me. They all agreed. They adopted me in record time. My mom said it was more difficult than giving birth. She, <laughs> the amount of work they had to go through with the adoption. She said there was one point where her and my dad were in different rooms, practically being interrogated. One was an interview-type situation, and one was a mountain of paperwork. <laughs> my dad opens the door and literally sees a mountain of paperwork, and he was like, I almost just turned around and walked out. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a very thorough, thankfully, very thorough process to adopt me. And they just, from the very beginning, knew how to raise me. It was meant to be. It was a series of miracles, one after the other. And, and the scene that I wish I could have been a fly on the wall, they let my, as a gift to my brothers, they let my brothers choose my name. So you can imagine these three boys sitting around, what about this name? No, no, I know her, I don't like her, we can't name her that. No, no, what about this name? They're arguing over the name, and they finally all agreed after, I think, a couple hours on Jennifer. And I just, again, I think that's such a special gift. And from the beginning, my parents modeled the lessons that I learned. They didn't just talk about the things they believed in. They put them into action. So I learned as a child by their actions. They, they taught me how to fight for my independence by fighting for my independence. When I first started, okay, it started with the doctors. We refused to believe she's going to be bucket girl the rest of her life. Are you kidding me? So they went and got a second opinion, thankfully. They went to Shriners Hospital, and Shriners is a huge... They have several branches in the U.S., and they are just incredible, incredible, incredible. My dad is, as you saw a little bit in the video, he's pretty direct, to the point, no frills kind of guy. So we go to the next, they go to the next set of doctors, to the Shriners, and they said, my dad said, all right, listen, before we get any further, all I want to know, is she going to be able to sit up on her own? That's all I want to know. And the doctor looked at him and said, Mr. Bricker, She's going to do things that are beyond your wildest imagination. She's going to do things that you never could have imagined her to do. And he said, that's it. That's what we knew. We knew there was more for her. We knew that that had to be her future. It never dawned on them to raise me any differently. Why would we treat her differently than we treated her boys? My wheelchair was never in the house when I was a kid. And the only modification my parents made, I was so tiny, I couldn't reach the light switches. So, you know the thing on, on, on blinds, you turn to open them? It's a long rod, a plastic rod. My dad drilled a tiny little hole in the top of it and attached it to the light switch so that I could pull it up and down and turn the lights on. But other than that, everything was normal the way anybody in this, in this building would live in a, in a house. Uh, and in fact, even more so, I was, the, I was the climber out of all of us. Go figure. I was a little monkey freaking people out, climbing the trees. And then my brothers taught me how to jump off of stuff. And then I really started freaking everybody out. They'd, they'd lay pillows on the floor. And they'd get me up on the chair or on the couch. Because even the couch, I was so small, it was pretty high for me to jump off of. So they'd teach me how to jump off and freak everybody out. And one time I got older and my dad said, you got to be careful. You need your wrist to walk. What happens if you, if you know you hurt your wrist? You can't just walk with one hand. I said, oh, yeah? I put my hand behind my back and I started walking with one hand. He was like, okay, whatever, whatever, that's fine. <laughs> I was pretty determined. They called it determined when I was younger my whole life. And I started school. And, again, my parents immediately I grew up in a very tiny town, okay, so everybody knew me, and, and it was the environment I needed to be in. A small town was great because everyone knew me, and it really wasn't different for anybody because people were raised with it, right? So it was not a big deal, the fact I didn't have legs. But in school, 
we had four stories of, of stairs. This is old school, built literally in 1912. So there's no elevator, right? This is not the city, <laughs> far from the city. So I was going up and down the stairs with everybody else. Well, they wanted to assign, this started in second grade. They wanted to assign an aide to carry my bags, and they made me leave class a little bit early and a little bit later because when everybody, there's about a three to five minute break, and everybody from several different grades goes up and down the stairs, right, and switches classes. So they're like, well, oh, there's what if, what if, this fear, well, 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 what if she doesn't get out of the way? What, well, what if someone steps on her fingers? What if, what if, what if, fear, fear, fear? And my dad said, listen, I guarantee the minute she gets her fingers stepped on, she's gonna learn how to get out of the way. She'll be fine. And I survived. I have all 10 of my fingers. No big deal, right? So they're all freaking out, freaking out. And my parents, it, they, they understood how serious it was from an early age. You know, she, I wasn't going to be a child the rest of my life. I was going to eventually be an adult. And those are formative years where I'm taking in every single thing I see and I hear. And they understood that. And they said, listen, she doesn't need this aid. And if you don't take this aid away from her, we're going to pull her out of this school and we're going to take her to a different school because we are raising her to be independent, not codependent. She is going to be a, an adult, a grown-up, living in the world, not having an aid with her constantly. You know, I can't, um, I often think about this, again, when I'm speaking. There would have been so many different outcomes, so many different future Jen Brickers had I had different parents. You know, there were 299 couples, couples that were on a waiting list to adopt me. Okay, I mean, it's kind of flattering to be that popular, but <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. But other than that, it's baffling because think about it. That means 299 different Jen Brickers, different ways that I think, different ways that I view myself that I view the world, that I view my whole identity and purpose and place in life. Can you imagine? I can guarantee you I would not be here today. I can guarantee it. And I know for a fact, had I been left in my biological family, that I wouldn't be here today. And, and my parents, I do, I do credit everything to them because they not only, they didn't just tolerate me. They weren't just, oh yeah, she's our adopted daughter. No, she's our daughter, and we are proud of her, and she was born this way for a reason, for a purpose, and she's going to change the world, and she is our answered prayer, and she is our blessing. If you grow up hearing that, you believe that. All I had was encouragement and love and support and self-esteem. They didn't cap or put a ceiling on my limits. There was no ceiling. There was no dreaming too high. I, I've, I wanted to be a mermaid and a fairy and live in the enchanted forest. And, you know, I loved Santa and all of these things that are magical creatures. But that transcends. They didn't stop me dreaming there. So I continued to dream in all other areas of my life. There was nothing that was not possible. There was no can't. There really was no can't. There really was no... Nothing that was too far to dream or too far to imagine. And they celebrated, I mean, anything little or a dog. I would just lose my mind. Oh, my gosh, that's so cute. Oh, I can't. I'm still that way. And they didn't just tolerate it. They embraced and celebrated that. And again, from the beginning, when they fought for my independence in school, fiercely, to the point of taking me out of that school, I saw from second grade what that meant to fight for my independence, to stand up for my independence. Not that you necessarily have to verbally argue or anything, but to really just stand up and refuse to, to be put in a box just because I didn't have legs. Sometimes I see people staring and like, that's fine, it's different, I get it. But I think, is it really that big of a deal? Like, is it, is it really that different? Like, I just don't see it, thankfully. But, you know, that's because I was wired from the beginning not to see it. No one else saw it. No one else focused on it. People were telling me when I was younger, uh, when I was in sports, so I did basketball, softball, volleyball, all of these things, and it never occurred to me to do a sport as a disabled sport. What, like what, Are you, me, do a sport in a wheelchair? Like, well, I don't even, how does that work? I can't even, I couldn't do my sports with my wheelchair. I was just with everybody else, and I loved Gymnastics, I loved volleyball. Those were my two favorite. I did softball and basketball as well for several years. 
But those two were just, I thrived. And never one time did my parents discourage me. Never, they could have easily told me all the hundred million reasons why I can't do it. There's always gonna be a million reasons why you can't do something, especially like Rajiv was saying, when you're doing something different that no one's doing, yeah, there's, you're going to kind of easily see the cans before you see the cans, but there's always going to be those. That's never going to change. You can change. You can focus on the cans, and that's how you can go. That's how you, your mind can just go wild. Who cares if you sound crazy? Who cares? You've got it in your brain. That's an imaginative, creative brain. That's exciting. That should be celebrated. It does start in the mind. It started in the mind with my parents. They taught me how to continue to dream, to continue to believe that I could do everything. So much so that, okay, Jen, you want to do all those sports? Awesome. And I said, you know what? We live in the middle of nowhere, and the most exciting thing to do is to go roller skating. So I want to go roller skating. Right. So you don't have legs. Correct. So where are you going to put the skates? Oh, well, I guess we'll just put them on your hands. I was obsessed with skating backwards, and I was obsessed with doing the limbo. How low can you go? OK, both of those things, obsessed with, right? And again, didn't occur to me that I couldn't skate. So I would have loved to have remembered this scene. We're going to the store, buying the skates, and I'm trying them on my hands. Oh, these are cute. Now, this fits a little tight, actually. No, no, I think I want the pink skates. The person selling the skates must have thought we were completely out of our mind. Like, what is she gonna, what is this girl with no legs gonna do with skates? It paid off though, because every single time after that, I won the limbo. So not bad. I was pretty excited, pretty proud of that accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. My next challenge to tackle after winning the limbo so many times, I decided it wasn't fair to compete in it anymore. <laughs> I, I was like, okay, now I've got a master skating backwards. So when you're skating, they blow the whistle and you switch positions, right? You either partner skate or you skate backwards or whatever. And so, of course, I'm all the way across the skating rink, farthest away from the beginning as you can get, and they blow the whistle to skate backwards. And I'm just like, okay, I just learned how to skate. How do I, so what? Okay, how do I skate backwards? I was so confused. It was this, I was very young, okay? It was a big deal for me. And I remember, does anyone in here know Thomas the Train, the little engine that could? Okay, all right, awesome. So my parents always read that to me as a kid. And, you know, each role, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. So I'm on the, in the skating rink, on the floor skating, and I'm just like, okay, well, Thomas literally with each role, and I'm on wheels, this is so cool. I'm just like Thomas the Train. So, all right, I think I can, I think I can. And I just, each role literally was saying this, and before I know it, I made it all the way across, the skating rink, and I had skated backwards. And it was, like, that's a funny kid analogy. You know, Thomas the Train, we all love him. We love his cartoon. We love his sayings. But that, how amazing is that? It was a practical use of Thomas the Train as a kid. And I think of it now as an adult. It totally transcends into our adult lives. Because every single day, the little life choices are the little wheel turns that Thomas does. So every day, we have choices to make. We have a million and one. Are we going to respond? Are we going to react? Are we going to yell? Are we going to smile? Are we going to choose to focus on the can? Are we going to choose to be positive, to, to, to own the day, not let the day own us? All of these decisions to listen to somebody, that's a big deal sometimes. Those little bitty decisions, and just that I've learned in my short time in life so far, it's the little choices that we make every day, the tiny little ones that maybe seem minuscule or not important, they're the ones that lead up to the big fireworks. Those little decisions are, they have to be, they are the journey to the amazing, over-the-top fireworks, 4th of July kind of thing. It's, it's those are essential, and those being aware every single day Living for today, not for tomorrow, not for next week, not for next month. I used to be notoriously guilty of that. And it stressed me out like no other. And I started living for today because you can just easily ignore who's right in front of you when you're thinking about the next five million things and you're stressing and your anxiety and you're worrying and half that stuff isn't even going to happen anyway. 
I was just, you know, I was going around and around in these circles and all of that from Thomas the Train. I mean, it's unbelievable how these things can spark from that. And then I come to my parents and I say, all right, now I want to be a gymnast. And they had to just think, really? Like, you couldn't choose the piano or <laughs> something easier? Really? But no, totally true, my parents' fashion. Okay, that's great. They took me to the gym. We had a power tumbling gym, to be specific, where I grew up, a tiny town. And I got to, again, give credit to my coaches. There. In I walk, bubbly, fierce, determination, confident as all. Yeah, oh, totally, I'm going to be a gymnast. And they're just, they, they had to be kind of stunned, like, well, okay, I mean, we've never, we've never coached anybody that way, but awesome. And they were, they were so on board. They took the challenge. They were amazing. They didn't treat me different either. They didn't give me any slack. None of my coaches in any of my sports treated me any differently. I remember doing suicides. Do you guys know what suicides are in basketball? You run halfway to the court, back, a fourth of the court, back, all the way to the court, back. And I'm like, cut me a break, man. I'm running with my arms. They're going to fall off. No, no, no special treatment. And I'm really grateful for that. And in tumbling, as I started, I, in two weeks, my coaches saw that I had natural raw talent and I got asked to start competing because you have to be asked to be on the team. You can't just be on the team and compete. And that was a huge deal. I got to wear the leotards with all the glitter and the gold and the fancy little jacket with my name. I was so excited about all of that. And, you know, started competing and going to these meets where I finally got to see other people. And all of a sudden, people were telling me I was an inspiration and they were watching me and everybody was cheering and I kept hearing, you're an inspiration. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I was so annoyed. I was like, "What? stop telling me I'm inspiration. That's so annoying. Like, seriously, I don't want to hear it anymore as a kid. I, but it was because I didn't understand. I didn't understand why it was such a big deal. You know, I, I'm just doing what I love. I'm just doing what makes me happy. You know, I, I didn't have to do the sports or do anything to prove someone wrong. I didn't have to. I wasn't forced into it by my parents. I kept wondering, I'm like, mom and dad, all of my friends' parents want them to be a gymnast or a football player or a basketball player or whatever. Why don't you tell me what you want me to be? And they're like, well, we want you to be what you, who you are, who you are meant to be, what makes you happy. That is what makes us happy. As a kid, I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. As an adult, I think it's the most genius thing in the world because they allowed me, they provided the environment, for me to blossom like a flower, to fully bloom, to explore every single corner and inch and facet of what I wanted to do and who I was. And they supported it and they backed it and they encouraged it with love and confidence and self-esteem. I had that entire foundation as a childhood all the way up until I was still current. Still, I still have that for my parents. And I think right before I turned 16, when I... Ask my mom if she knew anything about my biological family. And I find out that the girl I idolized my entire childhood was my biological sister. I think, I don't know how I could have handled that, even at 15, had I not had that entire foundation. Th those roots, that confidence, that self-esteem. Because... That was a lot, even at almost 16 years old, that was a lot to understand. I mean, who does that happen to? My mom tells me, I'm like, wait a minute, so information overload, computer sparks flying, smoke coming out of my ears. If I were a cartoon, that's what it would be happening. <laughs> it, was just, it was just insane. I mean, she, I'm like, wait a minute, so, so the girl that I watched as a child, the girl I idolized, the girl I literally said, don't we look alike? What if we were related? She's Romanian. I'm Romanian. She's fiery and I'm fiery. I'm spicy and she's spicy. And oh my gosh, don't we look alike? All of these things. How in the world is she actually my full-blooded biological sister? It was baffling. I was in shock. I was in disbelief. And then I was super pumped because she was my idol. But I also had a sister. I was raised with three brothers. So it was just on that element, on just purely a simple element, that was so exciting to me. 
And of course, immediately after I got through all of my initial emotions, I said, oh my gosh, I, I have to meet her. I, I'm pretty sure she has no idea I even exist. I want her to know that I'm here. I want her to know that she has a sister. And so I went on her website and like maybe a little bit of a stalker just for hours looking at her pictures, just a little bit. Don't judge me. So I'm going through all of these pictures and all of a sudden, I see myself with legs. I, it, my face planted on someone else's body. It was my younger sister, Christina. I never had anyone that looked like me where I grew up, in the middle of nowhere, farm town. I was, I was very tan as a kid and jet black hair, and just even that was very different where I grew up. And now I have someone that looks like my identical twin with legs. I mean, it was baffling. Like, oh, that's what I would look like with legs. Good to know. Interesting. It, it was so ironic. I, um, I got my dad. He was walking by, and the picture was up on the computer, and she was clearly visibly had legs. She was standing um, on skis in a ski, a ski resort. And I said, hey, Dad, look at this picture. He looked, he's, well, when did you go skiing? Oh, my gosh. That was it. He got it right after he said it. But it, lo it was just absolutely baffling. And so I'm seeing these pictures. And on one hand, it's exhilarating, and it's exciting, and it's just amazing, and I'm completely obsessed looking at all these pictures. And, but, you know, I see Christina and Dominique, and I just think, man, I belong right in between you two. I'm literally the middle sister, and you have no idea that I even exist. So it was a little disheartening. It was a little, it was discouraging and disheartening, but yet it's actually what fueled me. It's kind of interesting. It fueled me because now I have two sisters. One was my idol and one's my twin. Insane. And it was just so, I was so excited. And my uncle, conveniently enough, was a private investigator. Of course. <laughs> but why wouldn't he be in my life? <laughs> and so I contacted him and I said, okay, I want this to be done properly. I want you to reach out to Dimitri and Camelia Mochianu, my biological parents. And I want you to let them know that I know, because I'm pretty positive they've been keeping it a secret and my sisters don't know. And just so you know, the reason we found out, how, we f how I found out, how my parents found out, this was supposed to be a closed adoption. Okay, that means that all of the adoption documents about my biological family were supposed to be blacked out, literally blacked out. When the social worker, when my mom and dad adopted me, the social worker had all of the papers and she literally verbatim says, huh, well, these are all supposed to be blacked out. Eh, oh, well, here you go. <laughs> Again, who does that happen to? So without those papers, we would have never figured it out. I'm sitting at home. Me and my mom are sitting at home one day. I'm going on and on. We're watching gymnastics. I'm talking about Dominique. They pan to the audience, and they show Dimitri and Camelia Mochianu, my biological parents. And a light bulb goes off in my mom's head, and she's just like, man, that sounds familiar. Where do I know those names? She goes and gets my, my adoption papers from seven years ago, and she just she starts adding it up. Dimitri, Camelia, Romanian, sibling, six years older, Dominique. And she's just, wow, oh my gosh, holy cow, my daughter's idol is her sister. Sitting in the living room one day. And, you know, people say, yeah, but Jen, why didn't your parents tell you? Why did it take them so long to tell you? Well, I was seven years old, and it would have been kind of an insane mountain, tsunami, earthquake, everything you can imagine, to tell that to a seven-year-old. It just wasn't the right timing, and I completely agree with them. It was not the right timing. And also, my sister had had a very public emancipation from her parents at 17. It was a very... It was just a very sad kind of time, and I remember watching it. I didn't know she was my sister, but I remember watching it, and it was public, and it was really sad, and she was separating herself from her parents, and my parents also took her into consideration. And they said, you know what? She can't handle this right now either, as I got older even. So they decided, and legally, they weren't supposed to tell me because it was a closed adoption until I was 18. But when I came and asked specifically, they weren't going to lie to me, and that's why it came out exactly when it did. And I... I honestly fully support that, and I think it was the right decision because even at almost 16 years old, it was quite a lot to take in. And, and then 
to even further confirm that, you know, when my uncle first contacted my biological parents, I, I really thought that they would deny it. I don't know what you're talking about. We never gave up a child. Bye. They didn't deny it. But after the first conversation, there was silence on the other end. So they didn't want to continue the conversation. They, they wanted to continue keeping it a secret. Already 16 years, they wanted to continue the whole other lifetime of, of keeping me a secret. And so I said, okay, you know, that was my first failed attempt at contacting my biological family. And it, it kind of, I was expecting actually more negative than that. So I, I really wasn't, I was a little discouraged, but not completely shocked. Then I said, okay, let me regroup. All right, I'm gonna, okay, Dominique is of age. She's over 18. So I'm gonna re-strategize and I'm gonna contact her. Well, I, because I was a part of her website, I got an email and it said she's gonna be on this rock and roll gymnastics tour and she's gonna stop in Indianapolis, which was about two and a half hours from where I grew up. So I was 17, I was of course, like I had this genius idea, I was gonna show up to the meet, guns a blazing, and somehow get down to the floor, show her the adoption papers and tell her I was her sister. Yeah, no, of course it was a perfect idea. So in my head I was gung-ho, I was excited about a week and a half, two weeks before I was gonna go buy the tickets to go to this event, I get an email from her website saying, unfortunately, due to an injury, Dominique has to pull out of the competition. And I was just so bummed. I was, that was the point where I was very discouraged. I was very discouraged, very disheartened, because this was, I really thought this was gonna work. I, I really completely was convinced, 100%, this was it. And when I first found out, I said, I wanna be there when she gets married and I want her to be there when I graduate high school. And just as that second failed attempt happened, the other two things happened. I graduated high school and my sister got married. And it, again, just another blow, another blow to my entire plan, to my heart. You know, I really, I wanted to meet them so badly. At this point, I knew for sure they didn't know that I existed. And that was okay, but I just wanted them to know and, it was my job to find them. And so uh, when I was 19, I got accepted into a program at Disney World in Orlando, Florida. And it was about, this is very far away from where I grew up, 15, 15 and a half hours. And so I was ready to blow out of that tiny town. I was like, yep, city, bring it on. Orlando, Disney World, beach, yes. I was very excited, so I left at 19. And I knew within the first month I wasn't moving back. I extended my program and then I ended up just staying there. And that first year, I was just inundated with diversity and culture and all kinds of guys from all different parts of the world and all different parts of food and different friends and the beach and Disney World. All of these things were so new to me and I was so young. I mean, I was like constantly just eyes wide open, excited. And so the, the first year of being in Orlando, the thought of meeting my biological family somewhat uh, took a back burner for a little bit. Towards the end of that year, though, oh, man, it, it was consuming my thoughts. I was even my dreams. Every single thing was pointing to, you need to try again to meet your biological family. It was such a wake-up call. I'm like, okay, I hear you. I hear you. I get it. So this was my third and final shot to reach out to my biological family. And I, I called my uncle, my private investigator uncle, and I said, all right, listen, I know she lives in Ohio, and I know she's married to a guy named Mike, but I need you to get me your address, and I need you to get me your phone number. I called my parents, and I said, listen, I need you to copy every single adoption document, legal document you have, copy it, and send it my way. And then I had a pep talk with myself, and I was like, all right, Jen, get yourself together. This is your third and final shot. This is it. You've got to make, this one has to count. This one's got to work. So I packaged my entire heart and soul up, in this package, I, I, I copied pictures from when I was a baby all the way until I was, I was 20 at the time because the resemblance, you can see, is just unbelievable. There's no denying it. And, and I made sure that the legal documents with my parents, biological parents' signatures were on there so that she didn't think I was some crazy lunatic just saying, oh, I'm your sister. Sure you are. No, I wanted to make sure she knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was her sister. And then I specifically remember putting together this letter and I thought, all right, Am I gonna tell her that I don't have legs? Am I gonna not tell her? I mean, she's already finding out she has a long lost sister. Maybe I should just wait, like do it in two sections. So that's what I did. I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it out. I'm not gonna tell her. That's already enough to find out you have a long lost sister you didn't know about for 20 years. So I left that out. Then I went to the post office. 
packaged it up. I, I did every single possible imagination thing you could do at the post office. I had a signed receipt. I had a confirmed this. I had this. I grilled the poor lady at the post office, <laughs> going through every single scenario, repeating it 10 times. It was pretty, pretty funny. And then I just waited for two and a half weeks. It pins and needles. Towards the end of the two and a half weeks, I, I had to start thinking, I had to start preparing myself for the possibility that they weren't going to respond, that it wasn't going to be my happy ending, because this is already two and a half weeks. I mean, I, I would think if you find something like that out, you would respond pretty quickly. But she didn't. So I'm sitting here the longest two weeks of my whole life thinking, all right, Jen, you know what? If she doesn't respond, if they don't respond, you did everything you could. I put all the cards out there. I did every single thing I could. I left nothing unturned. I had no regrets. There was nothing more that I could have done. And one night, I was sitting on my floor in the living room in my apartment in Orlando. I was going through my mail, and it was Christmas time. And I just saw that I had a Christmas card. I, I didn't even pay attention. I don't know. Oh, cute, I got a Christmas card. And I was just opening it. And I opened the card. It was a small card. And a piece of paper fell out. And all I saw was Dominique's signature. And my heart just stopped. I, I think it actually stopped for a minute. It was pretty intense because this is not just two weeks that I was waiting. This is four years now at this point. Four years from when I first found out. And so then I have the letter. I don't want to open it because I don't know what it says. What if it's negative? What if she doesn't, ex what if she doesn't accept me? I don't know. But then I, I, I say it was a true Band-Aid life moment. I had to just rip it open and read it. And that's what I did. I ripped it open. I read it. And I said, you know what? Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. And I'll never forget, I got to the middle of the letter. And she said, you're about to be an auntie. And so the letter was better than I could have imagined. They accepted me and then some. The next day, I got flowers in the mail, and I still have that vase sitting next to my bed to this day where the flowers came in. A month later, I was on my way to work, going to Disney. I get a phone call. I didn't know the number. Hello, Jennifer. This is Dominique. I'm like blindsided, floored. Wait a minute. So this is my idol, but she's my sister. So she's my sister, but she's my idol. Like, what do you say? Best I could come up with was... Hello? And I, amazingly enough, conversation flowed supernaturally. It, we were on the phone an hour before I knew it and probably would have been on the phone five hours had I not had to go to work. And towards the end of the conversation, I thought, oh, yeah, I should probably tell her I don't have legs. This is probably the time. So I just, you know, right before I got off the phone, slipped it in, no big deal. Oh, I'm sure you know, but I was born without legs. It's no big deal. It's all good. <laughs> there was just silence on the other lane. <laughs> like, I could tell I almost felt bad, but it was really funny because she didn't know what to say, and she was trying to be polite, and she was, you know, and she's like, oh, well, wow, no, didn't know. I didn't know that. Wow. And we had just gotten done talking about all of my performing, and, and my performing career had just started, and all of the sports that I did, and how I loved gymnastics as well. And she was just, she was confused. You could tell a little bit, like, well, how does that work? You don't have legs. I don't understand, but I'm really trying. And she was so cute. And so uh, we, of course, end of conversation, we want to meet, we want to meet, we want to meet. So four months later, we all met in Cleveland, Ohio, at my sister's house. Dominique, I lived in Florida. Christina lived in Texas. And uh, Dominique lived in Ohio. So we all met there. And it was surreal but organic and natural, if that can happen all at once. <laughs> it did. <laughs> and so, I mean, I'll never forget the elevator doors opening at the, at the airport, and I see her right in front of me, and she's, of course, she's pushing my niece in the stroller, holding a long stem rose, and video cameraing, the, like videotaping the whole thing. So I'm like, do I say hi? Do I, like, hug the baby? Do I take the rose? Do I give you a hug? I'm not really sure, so I'm just going to do all of them at once. And it was, but it was so surreal. And then my younger, si my younger sister flies in. Not only does she have my face, now I'm talking to myself with legs, hearing my voice with legs. I mean, 
It was unbelievable. I just kept looking at her, and even after we knew each other for a while, she'd be like, are you staring at me again? <sighs> yes, I am. I can't. Don't judge me. I just couldn't get over how much we looked alike and sounded alike. We all had the same likes in food, and my younger sister's husband looks identical to my ex-boyfriend. I... <laughs> It's crazy, just the similarities, like twins reunited kind of thing. And so, you know, they, when we all met, it was a beautiful year. It was when my career had just started as an acrobat and an aerialist. And so the, the journey of my sisterhood and my career have gone together and grown together. And they got to see that from the beginning. And I've learned many, many lessons along this journey uh, as a speaker and a performer. But one thing I know, and that is reaffirmed and hit home every single time I speak, is that every single person in this audience, every single person everywhere, has special gifts and talents and abilities that are born to you and for you specifically. They are your passions. They are what excites you. They are what makes you stand up and scream and shout and dance and freak out and be excited. That's passion. You all have that in you. And they're all equally, equally as important and equally as powerful. Because they really, truly, you really, truly, with your talents, gifts, and abilities, that are for you so you don't have to be jealous of anyone else's. Because they're equally as powerful. They have, a pa they have the, the power, you have the power, to change someone's life. And that's not just like a kumbaya, doesn't that sound great, something awesome to say on stage. That's real. You all have things that make you excited. That's your passion. That's what you're naturally good at. You naturally are drawn to. You can use those. How awesome is that? You can use what you love, what makes you excited, what you're naturally good at. You're naturally so passionate about that it makes you turn your life upside down and act like a crazy person to change someone's life. And that in and of itself, following your passion and your dream, can inspire someone, can change someone's life. Yeah, but Jen, I don't have a platform, I don't have a stage. Yes, you do. Do you not interact with someone every day? Coworkers, friends, family? That's your platform, that's your stage. And if you don't think you're making an impact, you are seriously mistaken. People pay attention to you. The decisions you make, the choices you the yes or the no's, or the indifference, or the worst, the standing still. People see you. You make an impact, and you are equally significant. Just because I'm on a stage does not make me any more significant. Doesn't mean that my talents and gifts are any more effective. Everyone holds equal power. We're on an equal playing field. It's level. But when you realize that you have that, and you recognize that you have that power, then you got to do something with it. So it's kind of easy to deny that it's not there, because it's there whether you recognize it or not, right? It's there. But then there becomes a responsibility. I think there is a responsibility when you harness and use your gifts and your talents, because really the responsibility is to use them to change someone else's life. You all have that in you. Do you believe that? Wow. Come on. Do you believe that? Yeah. OK. I know that to be true. I know that to be true, guys. I know it. And I just challenge you today to dig deep. Just think of what makes you stand up and cheer and be so excited and be so passionate and so on fire. That's it. That is what you harness and you use and you protect to change a life. Just find out what yours is and go out and rock it and change the world. Thank you.